So we're going to talk today, um, you can see on this first slide, um, the first part of the talk is going to be on brain health and certain things that you can do for brain health. And then the second section is going to be on whole foods, what whole foods are, and so that you have a better understanding when you hear a lot of those nutritional terms batted around in the media, um, what people are talking about, and supplements. And then we're also going to talk about lifestyle choices because as um, Adrian said in my um, bio, I do I do look at the whole person. So it's not just about what people eat. It's not just about what people um, think and how they work when they do psychotherapy and occupational therapy, but it's also about lifestyle choices. So we're going to talk a lot about here to make for a healthier brain and a, and a um, healthier child or adult. So Adrian, how do I click to the next screen? Well, uh, you That's should be just, you're in control of your computer, you're just presenting. You just can uh, treat yeah. it as your, I would do a right arrow. Okay, here we go. Yeah, go. I tried the right arrow, it didn't work. The screen, okay, I got it. Okay, so um, this is a question, and since everybody has a chat, I would love to have people just answer the, this question in the chat. The brain, if any of you know, how much um, the brain uses how much of your body's total energy? Does anybody have any ideas? I don't see any answers in the chat. Ooh, ooh, my hand is ready. <laughs> Anybody? If not, I'll give you the answer. Okay, the answer is 20%. So 20% of total body energy is used by the brain, but it only weighs roughly two to three pounds. So if you think about however much you currently weigh, 20% of your energy that you, the, the calories that you take in is used by the brain. Um, so it's a pretty significant um, burner of the fuel that we eat. So what part of your body is closely connected to your brain and impacts your brain in a big way? Anybody have any ideas? I'm going to give you some hints. Do you think that um, it's your heart? Do you think that it's your digestive system? Or do you think that it's some other part of your body? Anybody have any thoughts? Okay. So your digestive system is very closely into your brain. gut. Your gut health is directly impacting your brain's health, and the two systems are connected by the vagus nerve. So we actually have learned that the brain and your digestive system, or um, known also as the gut, um, are connected. And actually, even in the fetus, the two the two organs are are connected. And as the fetus grows, they are connected by by this vagus nerve. And um, I'm going to go back to this. There are actually been studies, and I, I have been about the microbiome and the bacteria in the gut. Um, in that talk, I talked a lot more about how I talked some more, more about the foods that you eat healthy gut because that's really important. Um, it used to be in the gut, but now it's too late. So, next your gut. And the thing about this is um, if you may be being those people doing speaking, then perhaps have it. And when you feel you know, oh my gosh, my nervous you have a nice supplies in your stomach. So the thought that you have that your your ex is actually your your gut is not have a good 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 bacterial balance a little bit more and 
brain is emptied and you might be depressed or angry or anything. and we look at supplementing for deficiencies after that. So, um, and I want to just remind everybody that you cannot supplement a, away a poor diet. So I have a lot of people who come to me and they'll say, well, you know, I'm eating McDonald's and I'm eating this and I'm eating that, but I'm taking a multivitamin. Well, that multivitamin is great, but it's not going to really help your body to get what it needs if you're doing um, a lot of harm by eating a lot of junk food. Okay, so talking about the ABCs of eating for brain health. We're going to talk about today cleaning up your diet, getting rid of toxins, and supplementing when necessary. And then the, um, the lifestyle changes we're going to talk about are exercise, getting enough sleep, connecting to others, and limiting electronics. So in terms of good um, good food and good diet and how to really promote he a healthy brain, we need to look at these three micro, these are all macronutrients, proteins, carbohydrates, and healthy fats. So I'm going to talk about each of these categories and then we're going to talk about supplements. So proteins. For protein, um, proteins come, are, are, um, are usually come from animal animals, not always. I mean, we can get some protein from um, plant-based foods. But the foods that are important to eat are fish, fish eaten twice, two to three times per week. Um, and unfortunately, that is really the most that we should eat in a week because our waters are so polluted. And our fish, the, the fish that we do pick up, those pollutants, and we end up with a lot of um, a heavier toxic load if we eat more fish than tw two or three times a week. And ideally, if you can afford it, eating wild-caught fish, cold water, smaller fish for, um, for example, sardines, salmon, and herring. Um, the reason for that is because the bigger fish eat the smaller fish. So the bigger the fish is, the, the higher up they are on the food chain, the more toxins and poisons and pollutants they've actually consumed. And we are actually at the top of the food chain, and so we want to be really careful that whatever we eat, um, we are getting as few uh, toxins as possible. We're exposed to a lot of toxins in our environment, thousands and thousands of chemicals almost every day. And so if we can lower that toxic load just by eating a little bit less of those kinds of foods, um, we're doing our bodies a huge favor. Grass-fed beef uh, only once a week um, and organic poultry, so that means turkey, chicken, uh, nuts and seeds, and legumes, which are beans. So these are all the, the main ways of getting proteins. Um, and how is protein important to our brain? Proteins um, are broken down into amino acids. And then those amino acids are further broken down and converted into chemicals called neurotransmitters. And those brain chemicals have a lot to do with how we feel, how we manage our stress um, or perceive our stress, um, and how well we, we do a lot of other functions. So I just want to give you a little idea of how important these, these brain chemicals really are. If you are low, these are, these are four major neurotransmitters, GABA, acetylcholine, dopamine, and serotonin. So if you are low in, in the, the neurotransmitter GABA, you might actually feel anxious. If you're low in acetylcholine, acetylcholine actually helps with memory. So um, Alzheimer's is actually um, related to a low acetylcholine level. Dopamine is part of the reward center. It's part of your um, feeling good center. And, and if you are low in dopamine, you may have issues with ADHD and other behavior problems. Um, it's also related to the part of the brain where addiction lies. So um, 
people who are addicted to alcohol and drugs or people who are addicted to food um, often have low dopamine. And serotonin um, is related to depression. So you can see how really important having the right amount of protein is to have in your system because these neurotransmitters can affect all kinds of behavior. And you can, for example, feel anxious and come to see me. Let's say you come into my office and you, and you tell me you're not coming in to see me for nutrition. You're coming in to see me because you're feeling anxious. And you're talking to me about all kinds of anxiety and how you're having trouble managing your life and everything is making you feel anxious. You're having trouble sleeping. We can talk about what's going on in your life and those things may actually be affecting your life, some external um, events. But if we aren't looking at your nutrition and making sure that you actually have the right amount of GABA, the right amount of protein breaking down into GABA, we're not ever really going to be able to resolve the anxiety. So that's why um, my practice, in my practice I find it very important to look at not just the psychological piece but also the nutrition piece because we can't really talk away a deficiency in a, in, a, um, in a protein. We can't talk away a deficiency in a mineral that's causing you to feel some of the, the feelings that you're having. So also important to look at your children um, who have ADHD or who have anxiety or have depression and really look at their diet. And a lot of these kids, especially the ADHD kids, are low in dopamine. That's part of the, the neurological piece of ADHD. So if, we're, if we know that the child is already low in dopamine and then they're eating a diet that's high in macaroni and cheese, a lot of the, I find a lot of the kids with ADHD don't eat a lot of protein, but they do eat a lot of carbohydrates. So they're eating a lot of um, the foods that are highly addictive that actually hit that dopamine receptor site because it makes them feel better. But it only makes them feel better for the short term and so we really need to look at expanding their diet. And I know a lot of these kids are picky eaters, but we need to look at expanding their diet and creating a balanced diet so that their body can heal and can operate at the highest level possible so that when we actually treat them, we are treating them at the correct level and not trying to treat something that also includes a deficiency in a, nutri in a nutrient. Okay, carbohydrates. So. Carbohydrates, most people when they think about carbohydrates, they think about the white stuff. They think about sugar and they think about flour. They think about the cookies and the bread and the donuts. Um, and you know, people will come into my office and they'll say, oh, I've, I'm trying to cut out carbohydrates. But I don't think what a lot of people realize is that fruits and vegetables are also carbohydrates. And they're actually the carbohydrates that we need. Um, we have colorful fruits, colorful vegetables. You should be eating them every day, and you should be eating a minimum of five. And, and I say minimum. That is really such a small amount. Um, one serving of a fruit or a vegetable is really just a half a cup or a cup. Um, and it's so easy if you make some smoothies or if you do a stir fry to really get a lot of fruits and vegetables into your diet. Really important because those colorful fruits all those colors that you see in those plants are in the plants in order to protect the plants. They protect the plants from the environment, from predators, animals, um, um, insects, and those same colors that protect the plant actually have value to us. Those are the, those are the, the phytonutrients. They are um, nutrients that you can't necessarily um, measure but that our body needs. So it also gives the, those colors also, um, and the phytonutrients also give those plants um, their taste, their smell, uh, some of the things that really attract us to those, those plants. So making sure that you have a lot of variety, eating as many colorful fruits as possible. When I first started eating more fruits and vegetables, I used to go to um, the grocery store and I would purposefully pick a fruit or a vegetable every week that I had never tried before and I would try it and I would decide if I liked it then I could add it to my list of things that I would buy every week and if I didn't like it then okay so I didn't like it but trying to expand away from just apples and grapes and iceberg lettuce and really looking at as many colorful things as you can the summer is ending this is the greatest time of the year of course for um, a lot of fruits and vegetables the other thing about 
fruits and vegetables that I want to mention is um, people often say to me, well, it's really expensive to eat this way. If you eat seasonal fruits and vegetables, if you eat local as much as possible, it's really quite affordable. Um, so, for example, buying strawberries in the summer when strawberries are available and plentiful, they're not very expensive. If you try and buy strawberries in the wintertime, it, you're going to pay $7 for a pint um, because it's coming in from Chile. So you're also creating a bigger footprint um, in terms of the environment and having it flown up here and shipped up here. So staying in, in season, which does mean we're heading into the winter in the fall and there won't be as many choice, um, and certainly in the fruits, but still doing the best that you can um, and making them a lot of different choices. Going to the farmer's market is a great way of experimenting and finding seasonal and locally grown fruits and vegetables. Choosing complex carbohydrates like brown rice and quinoa. Um, complex carbohydrates help to convert certain proteins into neurotransmitters. They are not um, proteins in and of themselves, although quinoa actually is. Quinoa is the only grain that actually is a whole protein, which means that it has all of the essential amino acids. We have, um, there are about 23 amino acids that our bodies use. Uh, depending on the source, there's a, there are some, some are considered essential, some are considered non-essential, and some are considered conditionally essential. So essential um, amino acids are the, pro, are the foods, the amino acids that we actually have to eat every day because our body can't make them. So it is essential that we consume them every day. The non-essential amino acids come from proteins that our body can actually create with the materials that it has on its own. So we can eat protein, but the body has, can create the amino acids it needs on its own. Conditional amino acids means that they're not always essential and they're not always non-essential. It simply met, depends on the condition of the person at any given time. So if you have a deficiency in something, it may be that conden the conditionally essential amino acid may be essential for you at that time, where it may not be essential for somebody else. Someone else may have enough nutrients in their body that they can create it themselves, but maybe you're deficient in something and you can't. You're maybe deficient in a, a B vitamin that helps to convert an amino acid to um, a particular protein to an amino acid rather, or you might be deficient in an enzyme. So you might have to eat certain amino certain proteins to get those amino acids. And of course, we don't know what that is, which is why it's important to eat a wide variety and eat a good healthy portion of protein every single day so that we can be sure our body has exactly what it needs. Quinoa is one of those whole grains that is the only whole grain that is a, a whole protein. So it, it has those essential and non-essential um, amino acids that you need. Other, other um, carbo complex carbohydrates like brown rice or some of the other ones that are on the market that are kind of fun to experiment with like millet um, or amaranth, those need to be combined with something else in order to be a whole protein. So that's why you'll find like when you go and eat a Mexican meal, you're going to have rice and beans because the beans are, the, the, are a legume and the legumes have protein, but they're not a complete protein. However, when you combine it with the rice, which is a complex carbohydrate, it becomes a whole protein. So, that, so we need to be sure that we're combining, if you're eating a vegetarian diet in particular, you need to be sure that you're combining the right amount of complex carbohydrates with legumes and nuts and seeds to be sure that you're getting whole proteins. Um, okay. And on healthy fats. So fats have really gotten a bad rap uh, in our, in our um, culture. And this came about because many years ago there was a, um, an, um, I'm sorry, y'all, I'm a little jet lagged and my brain is not functioning at 100%. There was a researcher um, who uh, did a study on, on um, heart health cardiac health. His name was Ansel Keys, and he studied multiple countries and decided that in looking at people's cardiac health that fat was the bad guy and that fat was causing high levels of cholesterol 
and that we need to cut back on cholesterol in order to manage our, our heart health. Um, his research was faulty, um, and, but he released it anyway, and the medical community grabbed onto it pretty quickly. And, and over the past 30 to 50 years, you can see where when we, when we started looking at lowering the fat in our bodies, lowering the fat in our diets, that um, our obesity rates, our stroke rates, our heart disease rates, everything else has, has risen fairly quickly. So now we are circling back around and we're looking at fat in a completely different way. Um, fat is actually a very important nutrient and it's something that we should not be afraid of. Um, I actually strongly encourage my clients to eat fat, um, but you have to be careful and eat healthy fat. So your brain is mostly made from fat and 60% of it comes from a part of the fat called DHA. And it is critical for brain growth and development. So in particular for children, um, it is important, and particularly for, um, for pregnant women to be, who are feeding their babies um, it, um, in utero, it is important to be sure that you're consuming the right kinds of fat and that you're consuming enough, a lot of fat. Um, fat plays a key role in the cellular processes of memory and learning. So if you've got a child who has focus issues, who has processing issues, um, or, or even if they don't and they just need to do well in school, and for you as well, um, to make sure that you are eating enough fat because the brain relies on fat for the cells to keep talking to each other. The cells in your brain need to be flexible so that communication can flow freely, and if it does not, if the brain doesn't have enough fat, those cells can become stiff and more difficult um, to, to work together. So it is really important that we eat fat, which is good news because fat is delicious. It's part of what makes food taste good. Um, part of the problem that we've had with, um, with junk food, with all of the um, companies jumping onto the no fat, low fat bandwagon, is that when you take the fat out of food, it really tastes pretty bad. So they've had to add back in things like sugar and salt to make the food taste okay. And sugar, is a whole nother lecture, but sugar is actually the bad guy. Sugar is what's causing us to gain weight and get sick. So I, I really, again, strongly encourage people to add fat back into the diet so that they can crowd out the sugar and crowd out the salt um, and allow their body to get the nutrients that it really needs. But again, it's important to have the right kinds of fat. So this is a list of some of the, the healthy fats. Avocados. Um, avocados are a wonderful source of fat. And you can eat them um, just straight out of the, you know, I know people who cut, just cut them in half and scoop it out and eat a half of an avocado as a snack. It's a wonderful way um, to snack and it's filling. The other wonderful thing about fat besides that it tastes so good is that it is highly satiating. So when you eat it, you're not going to feel hungry for several hours after eating it. So it's going to hold you longer. So while people are often concerned about the calorie content, it is higher in calories than carbohydrates and proteins. Carbohydrates and proteins have four grams of calories, four calories per gram, um, but fat has nine. So it is higher. However, we can't eat as much of it because it fills us up. And we will eat less often. So in the end, we tend to eat less calories when we eat healthy fats. Coconut oil is absolutely one of my favorite uh, fats. Um, and now you can buy it pretty much anywhere. Uh, it used to be a little bit harder to source, but you can find it at any grocery store. Um, and if you, when you buy coconut oil and actually the extra virgin olive oil, be sure that you um, read the label. Make sure that it says that it's cold pressed. Um, processed an oil is the um, the less nutrients it has and the more rancidity it possibly has, which causes free radicals. And I know y'all have all heard about antioxidants and free radicals. Um, free radicals are uh, molecules in our bodies that are missing um, an electron and they kind of bounce around and cause a lot of damage, including wrinkles. So um, we eat antioxidants to um, loan those free radicals, uh, that electron that it's missing to help them to calm down and not bounce around in our body quite so much. So when you eat a rancid oil, it creates those free radicals. So it creates a bit of a toxic load. 
So you want to be sure that you um, find coconut oils and olive oils that are fresh, fresh, uh, first press and cold pressed uh, because that will eliminate uh, that issue. Coconut oil is wonderful for cooking. Um, in fact, I only cook in coconut oil because it has a high heat point. It can tolerate heat before it becomes rancid or it becomes a trans fat. So I strongly recommend using it. It does have a distinct flavor, um, but it actually lends a sweetness to food. And um, in, at least in my home, we have found that um, it really enhances the way that our food tastes. Extra virgin olive oil. Um, extra virgin olive oil is a monosaturated fat. It's very good for you. Um, there have been a lot of studies done on it, um, particularly through the Mediterranean diet study. Um, it's good for your health. It's good for your heart. Um, but again, be sure that it's extra virgin. It's cold press. It's first press. Um, please avoid the extra virgin olive oils that are low fat or light fat because those, again, have been highly processed. Um, you're still going to get the same amount of calories but you're not getting the nutrient value, and in, and in fact, you're getting, um, you're getting some of that oxidization that actually causes damage in your body. Um, if you can go to the farmer's market and find an extra virgin olive oil that's actually cloudy, that's the best because that has really got a lot of the, um, the first press olive oil in it um, and a lot of those nutrients. Um, I don't cook in olive oil. Um, it is good for using cooking heat point. So I use it for finishing things. So for example, if I roast something in the oven, when I bring it out, when I, like if I roast vegetables in the oven and I put them in a bowl to serve them, I might finish it with olive oil before I serve it. Um, and olive oil is a great way of making your own salad dressings at home. Um, there are lots of easy ways of making salad dressings um, and a, a good way of not getting a lot of chemicals and extra stuff by avoiding um, store-bought um, salad dressings. And then grass-fed organic butter. Uh, regular butter comes from cow's milk that has, comes from cows in the U.S. typically that have been fed antibiotics and hormones. Um, you'll find that if you buy a grass-fed organic butter, it's usually a very rich yellow, deep yellow color as opposed to the regular stuff that you buy um, that's not organic. It's kind of a pale light yellow. Um, Carry Gold is one of the uh, best brands, easiest brands to find that's a grass-fed organic butter. And I've actually found Carry Gold at, at Walmart, um, and it's under $3 for a brick. So um, you can find it at other grocery stores, and it can go as high as almost close to $4. $4. But Walmart, like I said, I've found has had the best prices. So usually we go to Walmart, we buy a bunch of bricks, and we stick them in the freezer um, and just pull them out as we need to. Um, and then having some fun with herbs and spices. People don't really think about herbs and spices as things that have nutrients, but they do. Cinnamon is a wonderful spice. It actually helps to lower blood, blood um, sugar. Cilantro and parsley taste great. Um, I know some people don't like cilantro. Some people actually have um, a genetic glitch. My son actually has this. It tastes like soap. Um, and, um, but if you like cilantro, cilantro and parsley are one of those deep green leafy vegetables that really adds a lot of good nutrients as part of that, um, that carbohydrate vegetable category. Turmeric is a, um, a wonderful spice. Um, it's kind of, it's a yellow color. It's an anti-inflammatory. Um, it's used in cooking. I sometimes buy turmeric uh, roots. They look like little fingers. Um, and I stick them in my smoothie. Um, simply for the anti-inflammatory um, benefits that you get. And the same with ginger. Ginger is also an anti-inflammatory. Uh, and anti and I didn't talk about this much but at all, actually, but um, inflammation is really the foundation for a lot of our diseases, um, including heart disease. So when diet, we're talking about really keeping the body with at a low lowering inflammation because over time, inflammation causes all kinds of illnesses. So if we want good brain health and good overall health and wellness, making sure that our, our bodies are as, um, have as little inflammation as possible is important. Okay, I was, um, 
I was in Augusta, Georgia with my son a couple weekends ago, and we walked into Kroger, and this, this display was in Kroger in the front. And I just, I had to take a picture. I knew I would find a, a way to use this. Um, <laughs> this is, you know, the standard American diet. Um, and if you think about standard American diet, if you spell those words out and you look at the first letter of each of those words, it spells out the word sad. Standard American diet is a sad diet. It is very high in sugar and processed foods. So I thought that this display was a wonderful example of the, the standard American diet, um, all, that, all that wonderful candy. Um, so foods to avoid in terms of helping your body and your brain to be healthy, uh, simple sugars, white sugar, and white flour. And I touched on this a little while ago, and I, I do have a whole lecture that I'm hoping to do, I think, in the fall, later in the fall, uh, to really talk about sugar. Um, we've, we've been coached that fat is the bad guy, and as I said, fat is actually a really healthy food that we need to eat a lot of. White sugar and white flour are really the bad guys. They're really the, the they are caught the causers of the inflammation. They cause um, weight gain, um, and they really wreak havoc in our bodies. So really avoiding those, and I know um, it's difficult, it's a challenge in our society, um, but that's one of the things that I can help people with and that I do help people with in my practice. There are a lot of good alternatives. Um, it just takes a little bit of effort and once you learn how to do it, it becomes quite easy. Um, I have, I'm working with a client right now. I've been working with her for a couple years, and we've been working on getting her off of sugar. And she, um, she finally did a detox about three or four months ago. And she came into my office recently, and she said she had tasted something that she used to really eat all the time. Um, I think it was some sort of cake that her family enjoys. And she said she took one bite of it, and she, she had to spit it out. She said she couldn't believe how sweet it tasted and that she used to eat that as much as she had. Um, so once you, once you change the way that you experience sugar, you do find that foods like the foods that you can see on my screen are really difficult to eat because they're too sweet. Um, but we've, we've all gotten a high tolerance for sugar, so we really have to detox and learn how to find um, – other, other sweets and other ways of, of managing that sweet tooth that we have. Avoiding highly processed foods. Um, processing, we all process food. When you, when you peel an apple, you process the apple. But when I talk about highly processed foods, I'm talking about the foods that are in boxes and packages in the middle of the grocery store. Those are the foods that, um, that are convenient, um, they're fun to eat, but they are filled with chemicals and they're filled with salt and sugar and fat, um, which is really a, a very dangerous combination. But learning how to feed your child and feed yourself healthy and not use processed foods is also a process. Um, we've all gotten very comfortable at popping things in the microwave. So learning how to cook, learning how to cook efficiently, learning how to buy foods um, and keep your grocery bill at a reasonable um, place financially takes a little bit of practice, but it can be done. And when once you do it, you will be amazed at how good you feel. Um, and then avoiding clear oils, corn oil, soybean oil, vegetable oil, all those oils that you find on the, um, the grocery store shelf, the, um, they really... Um, they really have been heavily processed, and they are not good for you, and they don't have good heat points, so they turn rancid when you cook them. Um, and I see that somebody asked a question about what is trans fats and why is that bad. So this is a good time to answer that question. Trans fats uh, are fats that have been changed in the processing of the food, and it becomes a molecular change so that there's a hook on the end of the, the molecule. And it doesn't occur naturally in the, um, in the environment. So when we eat something that has a trans fat, our body doesn't recognize it and doesn't know what to do with it. And so typically it stores it. So we typically will be storing trans fats, um, and they have some unhealthy consequences. So um, actually, I think the government recently passed a law that all trans fats have to be removed from fast food by the year, I want to say 2017. I'm not sure. 
but you may, some of you may remember years ago there was a dad in California who um, raised a stink about Oreos because the um, center, the white part of the Oreo had trans fats. And um, they, they actually ended up changing the formula and taking the trans fats out. So you want to avoid trans fats and you want to avoid creating trans fats in your own kitchen. Okay, supplements. So as I, as I started to talk about earlier, um, brain problems, the gut and the brain are connected. And so brain problems, issues with the brain, whether it's anxiety or depression or um, ADHD, often begin with poor digestion. Um, and it's, it's an area that I find fascinating and an area that most people don't think about um, and don't really look at. But poor digestion, poor gut flora, and leaky gut um, can all affect our brains. So let's talk, so let me talk a little bit more about this. Um, poor digestion and poor gut flora really go together. Um, the gut flora is the amount of bacteria and the kinds of bacteria that we have in our guts. And we are learning that um, that balance is extremely important to our overall health. And we also know um, that 95% of um, serotonin is actually made in the gut. And if you remember earlier, I talked about the neurotransmitter um, serotonin and having, that having been connected to depression. 95% um, of the serotonin is made in your gut and then is trans transferred up to the brain. So obviously serotonin helps you to feel happy, it makes you feel good. When you walk outside and it's a beautiful day and you say, oh, I feel so, it's so good, I feel so calm, it's so pretty out, that's serotonin rushing into your brain. So 95% of that is made in your gut. So obviously if you want to feel happy and you don't want to feel depression, Making sure that you have enough serotonin being produced is important. Um, the gut flora also helps in balancing our in immune system. 75% of your immune system is actually in your gut. So when people get sick, it may not be because they were exposed to um, some cold air or the rain or something. It's because they didn't have the right gut flora to, to fight off whatever um, virus may have entered their system. So making sure that we're balanced in our gut is extremely important. And finally, leaky gut, which is actually exactly what it sounds like. Um, in your gut, you have your colon, and your colon is lined with these little tiny hairs, these little microvilli, and they should have a close, tight juncture. I don't have a picture in this um, PowerPoint. I have it in another one, but they're tightly, um, they're tightly pressed together in order to keep the food processing inside your gut and not into in your bloodstream. If you are having um, issues with leaky gut because you have allergies or you have um, some poor digestive issues, sometimes those villi will start to separate and there'll be gaps in the villi. And what happens then is that as the food is moving through the colon, some molecules can stray outside of the, um, the villi and into your bloodstream. And when that happens, your body recognizes that those molecules don't belong there, that they're foreign objects. And you end up having allergic reactions. And this is a lot of times where food sensitivities and food allergies come from. So you might also hear when you eat gluten, one of the, uh, the side effects of somebody who's sensitive to gluten is that they have a leaky gut. So what we want to do is we want to remove those toxins, close those junctures up, and heal the gut. Um, and so eating the right bacteria, making sure you're getting the right balance in your gut is important for doing that. Okay, so where do you find those good bugs that help to support that gut? They're known as probiotics. Many of you have probably heard that term before. And they're found in fermented foods like kimchi and yogurt and kombucha. Um, kimchi is a Korean dish. You can find it in most grocery stores. Um, it comes in mild to very spicy, and the Koreans actually eat it every day um, before every meal. And they learned a long time ago that it helps with their digestive system. Yogurt, um, you have to be careful to make, make sure you buy yogurts that have ac active cultures. Some, um, some yogurts have been highly processed and they don't really have any um, probiotics in them but there are plenty on the market that do. Just read the label and make sure that it says active cultures. And kombucha is actually a fermented tea 
Um, I actually make it at home. It, you can buy it in the store. It's kind of expensive, actually, to buy it in the store, which is why I brew it at home. Um, and a couple years ago, the government actually thought that kombucha had alcohol in it, and they pulled all of it off the shelves and tested it and wanted to make sure that labels were correct. Um, and they, they decided that there was not enough alcohol in it to even put it on the label. So it is not it is a fermented tea drink, um, but it does not have an alcohol content that um, that would be problematic. Um, it has sort of an acidy, vinegary taste to it. It's somewhat an acquired taste, but um, it does it's a fermented food and it does give you um, a probiotic benefit. Um, tempeh is a fermented tofu, and you can find that in the refrigerated section. Um, it comes in a uh, sort of a, a rectangular cake-like, um, it's dense, and it's, it's in a, um, a cellophane kind of wrapper, and it's usually with all the other tofu products. Um, Grass-fed cheese, um, raw, raw cheese ideally, or cheese from Europe. Um, and why is that? Raw cheese is difficult to find um, in this country. Everything is pasteurized. Um, but grass-fed cheese from Europe is important because, again, what we feed our cows goes into the cheese, and cheese is a very concentrated version of milk, so you're going to be getting a lot more of whatever the cows have been fed in terms of um, antibiotics or other hormones. Um, so just read the label and don't buy cheese from, um, from uh, the States, you know, like cheese from Wisconsin buy cheese that's, that's been made in Europe. And actually, if any of you shop at um, Trader Joe's, Trader Joe's has a very nice selection of very reasonably priced cheeses um, made in New Zealand. Um, they're delicious, um, so those are also safe, the New Zealand cheeses or the European cheeses. And then also you can supplement. You can take a probiotic, um, and there's, there's nothing wrong with that. The uh, only thing that I caution is that you check with somebody about the supplement, about the probiotic before you take it. There are, um, there are some strains in some of the probiotics that might um, be negatively impacting your child depending on diagnosis, so double checking uh, the strains before. Okay, and I, I stuck this in one more time. I'm going to skip this one and move on. These are um, for supplements, um, serotonin support. There are supplements that you can take um, to support your brain. 5-HTP um, or tryptophan and, and to sleep is melatonin. And serotonin actually converts to melatonin at night. So um, it's all part of a, a, the same chain breaking down. Um, GABA support, um, GABA again, remember for anxiety, GABA or L-theanine um, help with brain help with, um, with helping with the anxiety. Um, I'm aware that we're running out of time, I'm sorry I'm rushing now. Dopamine, um, you can take L-tyrosine and after one e week you can add L-phenylalanine. Acetylcholine support, um, GPC or choline. And finally, I want to talk very um, briefly about lifestyle choices because this I find very, I also think is key. Sleep is really important, making sure that you or your child get enough sleep. Teenagers need more than children. Um, kids should have about eight to, to nine hours of sleep, adults seven to eight hours, and teens can sleep as much as 10 to 12 hours a day. They don't always find the time for that, but they can benefit that from that. Sleep is the time our body resets and heals, um, and certain hormones actually come into play. So make, making sure that we get a long, deep, uninterrupted sleep is very important. Exercise, making sure our brain gets oxygen, having some free time, having some play, um, moving our bodies, also important. Limiting electronics, I really want to um, touch on this for a second. Um, we have become a very electronically savvy um, culture and our children in particular and kids in particular with ADHD uh, tend to get really stuck on electronics. There's been some new research showing that um, uh, using too many electronics is limiting our children's IQ. It's also limiting their social skills. Um, and you can see, at least in this picture, I have a dad who's interacting with his children. 
So I'm not saying to not use electronics, but certainly limiting the amount um, every day. Um, and um, I have some more uh, statistics about how much each, you know, children should be watching. Um, toddlers should probably not spend more than 30 minutes in front of uh, any electronic, and it should be educational in nature. And it goes up from there, but the most that children should be using any electronics during the course of the day is a couple of hours. So that includes computer time, video time, uh, phone time, everything that they do in front of a screen. Enjoying friends, making sure that your kids are getting some social interaction, and you as well. It's important to connect with people. Electronics sometimes um, interferes with that, so turning off the electronics and spending some time with other people is important. And that is the end. So I wanted to leave a few minutes for some Q&A if we have time. Um, I saw a question on something on fresh, oh, there was a question about um, what's the percentage benefit I lose when using frozen fruits and vegetables as opposed to fresh. Actually, you don't. Um, in some cases, frozen vegetables and fruits are better than the fresh because they're usually fro flash frozen on site. So the nutrients are really locked in as opposed to the fresh stuff that might get trucked from a, um, a quite a distance and then sit on the shelf and then sit in your refrigerator and it's losing nutrients every day. So um, there's actually a lot of benefits. So I, I, I think frozen is great. Um, canned food, not, not as much, but still a good option. 